Hello, hello, hello. This week is an absolute belter. This genuinely could be the best podcast that I've done so far. Really, really happy with it. Dr. Ewan Lawson is my guest. He is the author of The Healthy Writer, also a general practitioner of medicine in the UK, and the host of the Blocology podcast. Check that out on iTunes, Stitcher, all those good places. And today we are talking about what it's like working at a desk. So very, very high proportion of people will spend at least a significant period of their week sat down working at a desk, looking at a screen. What we try to go through today is with the help of Dr. Lawson's expertise is to break down exactly what is good and bad practice when it comes to designing your workstation. So we're talking from seating posture, height of screen, cranial angle looking down, angle for your wrists, what you can do about reducing RSI, what you can do about reducing um, stress on your eyes, improving your sleep, your work rhythms, how you can use some productivity tools and some productivity hacks to batch together your work into windows so that you're always accountable to yourself and so that you can improve your productivity. We go into journaling, we go into the health effects of sitting, of being sedentary. This really is absolutely jam-packed and I'm incredibly happy with it. Also, I have to say, the long-awaited Love Island podcast is now available and it will be a YouTube exclusive for the foreseeable future. So if you wanted to hear what it's really like living on Love Island with me, Johnny and Yusuf, you have to go online. Head to YouTube and search Modern Wisdom Podcast. It'll come up. The response has been fantastic. We've broken through, I think, 3K views maybe already. Really, really happy with it. I've had loads of messages about it. So make sure that you head online. If you love the podcast on audio, every episode will be made available on YouTube as well now. And I'm going to be uploading video files for all of the old ones, including all subsequent episodes as well. Make sure that you head there, press subscribe, and please support the channel. But now it's time for Dr. Ewan Lawson. Enjoy, make some notes, and hopefully you will wake up tomorrow with a fresh set of eyes before you go to work. Dr. Ewan Lawson, welcome to Modern Wisdom. Hello, Chris. How are you? Very well, thank you. And yourself? Yeah, very good. Thank you. So I put a post out on my Instagram earlier today and I said, do you work at a desk? Do you suffer with any uh, physical ailments or repetitive strain injury, neck pain, back pain, tight hips? And my inbox absolutely exploded. I think I could have announced that I was getting married or having a child and would have probably got less of a response. Um, <laughs> and yeah, the the problem of working at a desk and sitting looking at a computer seems to be so widespread. And it was it was a, a real a real shock to me just how many people are, 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 for want of a better term, kind of suffering in silence, dealing with it as a byproduct of well, this is work and the same way as going down the coal mine, you know, yeah. uh, however many years ago would have been, oh, well, you know, this is just, it's just a um, an issue that comes along with the particular chosen industry that I'm in. Um, why do you think that the use of desk work is so widespread, but the optimization of it and the making of it to be a healthy environment doesn't seem to be? Um, I, mean, I guess the whole kind of, I, I think you're right, it's a bit of a modern plague, isn't it? There are people are absolutely just getting increasingly aware of the, the pain it's putting them through. Um, it, I guess the problems with ergonomics and things have been known for a long time, but I wonder if it's just a case of, a, you know, it's a bit, there's a bit of catching up to do You're in that sort of phase where it's become the social norm to look at a computer all the time. And if you think about it, it's only, you know, it's only 10, 20 years ago, we didn't have little screens to look at. The iPhone was only invented, iPad only appeared, you know, a, a decade ago, or whatever it was. It's a really short period of time, isn't it? Yeah. And so that, that the health related consequences of doing, looking at screens all the time, looking at computers, 
that as screen time has just gone through the roof in the last few years. And I don't think the healthy kind of approaches to it have quite caught up yet, perhaps. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I think that's definitely, definitely an issue that you've got the industry being ahead of the, yeah. the research to a degree, or at least the um, distribution of it and people's understanding. So hopefully today we can start to uh, mitigate some of those problems. And people yeah, may, sure. People may uh, be waking up tomorrow with a fresh set of eyes as they go into work. So can you, um, can you give us a little bit of background to yourself, please, for the listeners who don't yeah, know who you are? Yeah, so... Um uh, I'm a I'm a doctor. I'm, I'm a GP, so a general practitioner. And for those of them, those of the people not based in the kind of UK or Australia, New Zealand, other places, the GP is just a kind of like a, a specialist in family medicine. So it's cradle to the grave stuff. We see people before they get to hospital, from children to adults to kind of uh, palliative care, end of life stuff as well. So yeah. very much kind of the full spectrum of health problems. And we also spend a lot of time looking after people and there's prevent, there's a certain element of preventative health and managing people, helping people with, um, lifestyle things like obesity or other smoking, other related factors like that. Um, I have, um, I was in the army a few years ago. I've always had an interest in being physically healthy, of course, but like everybody, I've had my own set of, you know, wrestling with these kind of problems, spending too much time sitting at a desk or trying to lose a little bit of weight, trying to be active in a world that is determined to get us to eat more <laughs> all the time. Yeah. And that's one of my big moans about the modern world is how it's constantly, certainly in the Western world where you know, the society is pretty much trying to ram food down our throats yes. 99% of the time. Wrestling with all that, trying to keep fit, trying to kind of maintain family life, not trying to get burned out, um, trying to stay fit and well. So that, that's my own personal interest. Um, and my it obviously aligns with my personal and uh, my professional life as well as a um, as a doctor. Yeah. Um, and I I was involved in writing a book last year with um, uh, Joanna Penn, a kind of well known uh, creative entrepreneur, non fiction fiction writer, and um, a book called The Healthy Writer, where we and it was very much written for writers and for that group of people. But I think probably a lot of the stuff in there is applicable to anyone who finds themselves parked in front of a computer for their working life absolutely they're they're not getting active enough and they just want to do something about it yeah i agree i think that's i wouldn't like to guess the um the percentage of people but a a large majority of almost everyone will spend over 15 20 hours a week at sort of towards the bottom end and then you're talking if you work in a call center or if you're a knowledge worker of pretty much any kind it's that 37 and a half hours a week is probably 37 hours sat, yeah, sat, sat at a screen. Yeah, it's insane. And I mean, the, the, I mean, there's the actual physical effect of just being sat there, but it's just the fact you're not moving as well, that kind of, and it falls into, it's, it's now become slightly a cliche that sitting is the new smoking. Um, <laughs> and they, it, it, it's kind of, a lot of people have heard that in the last few years, but I think that kind of lack of movement, that's, and you know, the sedentary life, that's, a, that's a massively toxic, I so think. And just just how destructive is it? Um, I think it's certainly been it, the, some of the evidence around this is hard to pick out. Actually, that, I guess that's my other interest that I'm really inter- I'm really keen on actually delving into the evidence and not just kind of putting out, uh, you, you know, a kind of vague opinion. Anecdotal. Actually, yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I recognize the importance of anecdotes as well. That, <laughs> you know, in a certain extent, everybody that comes in to see you as a patient as and, and you know, they're, they're an individual <laughs> and evid- there's problems with applying evidence to individuals. That's yeah. a, that's the challenge of being a doctor. Um, it, it's hard to put a number on it because sometimes the relationship between sitting and poor health isn't completely demonstrable. It's not completely easy to show. Um, and it's a little bit contradictory in places. So I would, you would struggle to quantify it. Mm -hmm. I think what it's easier to show is that people who are physically active enjoy, uh, longer life, better quality of life, um, and a whole lot of other kind of measurements that go with that in terms of their risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they're all massively improved by being active. And it's harder to prove that just sitting as an activity is actually bad for you. Yeah, I but think I think it's the general it's the general sort of the whole picture of how sedentary you are that's really important. Yeah, for sure. I think certainly for myself, I um I could probably hold my hands up and say that I know I train very hard when I do and go, go and do physical activity. But I also know that I'm very sedentary at other points as well. Yeah. And I think I've probably kidded myself into believing for quite a while that, well, it's fine. I'm I'm looking after my activity levels across the day. Therefore, if I spend three hours 
at a period in between toilet breaks, sitting at my desk and not moving and staring at screen, that's fine because the physical effects will be mitigated by me binning myself in a, a two hour CrossFit session or whatever it might be. Yeah. Is, well, is, that, yeah. is that the wrong way to look at it? No, no, I actually, there is, I, I looked into this a little bit for the book as well. And there's something that, you know, that you fall into that sort of slight category of weekend warrior, though I recognize it's not always just at the weekends. Yep. And there is, there is some evidence that if you do your exercise batched up, say at the weekend in that classic weekend warrior kind of approach, that does seem to, that does seem to be helpful. So you, you can mitigate some of the harms of your rest of your week being relatively inactive. Okay. Um, I think that some of the difficulty is you mentioned coal miners at the start. Actually, <laughs> the difficulty with that is coal miners were incredibly physically active. They didn't do any. <laughs> they didn't do any sitting down. Okay. They, well, I mean, at were, least that was that was one one bonus yeah. to take away from it, I suppose. Yeah, but they were incredibly good at dying young for various reasons. <laughs> and but if you look at senior executives, like you know, your average CEO, they spend their whole life sitting down. Yeah. But their sort of societal level that they operate at, they're incredibly likely to have good health outcomes as well. So that's why this sort of research around sitting and longevity gets a little bit tricky in places because you've got to take into account all the other stuff like we're smoking and drinking and exercise generally. Yeah. I think if you look at a bit of a, one, I've certainly saw one academic paper which looked at all the evidence and it certainly suggested that sitting down and being inactive actually caused deaths. And so I think it's reasonable to say sitting is killing people. Wow. But that kind of, it's always, as Ben Goldacre would say, it's it's always, a, it's a, it was a, I think you'll find it's a little bit more complicated. Yeah. There's always complications around the edges. But um, being active and uh, tackling the sitting is clearly a massive priority for most people. Yeah, definitely. So, like I say, with this uh, with this Instagram post that I fired out earlier on, yeah. I got a whole host of uh, of common ailments, and there was an awful lot of cross <laughs> an awful lot of crossover. It was probably a fairly representative sample as well. It was about one hundred and twenty messages, so I've got a, I got yeah. a good a good sample size to work from. Um, yeah. I wanted to speak to yourself first off and try and get any common mistakes which people make when designing a workstation and on the backside of that what are the op the most optimal fixes for them okay so i'm i've not ever seen any rev evidence on what the, the mistakes people make but what i would say is that the big the initial mistake is most people don't make any effort to design their workstation at all <laughs> That, that is is so there a most, seat? Is there a table? Is there a laptop? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fine. Is there anybody else sat there? No, this will do. Okay. That is probably the approach. And so hot desking, that's certainly going to be the approach that a lot of people have. Yeah. Well, that's um, all you can do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You just got to turn up and plonk your butt down and, you know, and if you get a spare seat in the library, if you're a student, then you're happy. <laughs> uh, and it's often the way it goes. So I, I'm not sure about specific mistakes people make. Um, the kind of things that the first thing I would, we could perhaps talk about is laptops and notebooks. Yeah. And I, I would say they they are kind of like the they they are they are to, they are toxic equivalent ergonomically. They are pretty horrific, <laughs> and um, they 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 put you in all the wrong position completely. And using a laptop and just typing on it without any kind of effort to change it, the position that you're in. Could will for a lot of people be a source of a great deal of problems. Okay. So the first thing they do is they they put your wrists at all the wrong angles, and um, the ideal position for your wrists is the not resting on anything, and probably at about sort of parallel to the floor and ninety degrees to your body. So the only way you can fix that normally is by adjusting the height of your keyboard. Now, if you're designing a workstation, then you can arrange for your desk to be at exactly the right height. Yeah. Um, so that you can make that work for you relative reasonably easy. The best way to fix it with a laptop is not to use the keyboard on the laptop, is to get an external keyboard. Okay. Uh, and then, because they're just not, you know, you've got the mouse sat in front of you, it's awkward. It tends to, your wrists end up contorted in the wrong position. So an external keyboard is usually a really good investment. Um, the next thing after that is that you're probably always looking down at it if it's a laptop, unless you're, unless you're very small in stature. <laughs> you're, going to be, you're always going to be craning down at your laptop. And so raising your laptop up, so your eye, so your neck's in a neutral position is the best way. And that does mean it needs to come up quite a bit. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the screen of a laptop is naturally very low. Yeah. And, am I right in thinking that having that cranial angle being more towards the floor will apply more stress to... I, I mean, I think that's the general thought. And I kind of, I'm not an expert in ergonomics in that regard, but I certainly know that good ergonomic practice is to have your neck in a reasonably neutral position because that... 
which is generally just sort of looking straight ahead, eyes slightly down, possibly. So eyes um, eyes level with the top of the screen, right? Yeah, that works well. If your eyes are level with the top edge, then actually you're you're just looking very slightly down at the screen itself. Um, that's a, that's usually a good way to do it, um, and that just stops your neck muscles having to work it, as hard when they're when you're in a no- normal position. So that's highly likely to relieve a lot of. Um, problems and discomfort and you've got to remember even things like you know tension headaches if your neck's in the wrong position and you're under a bit of stress then a lot of headaches that we certainly we see as a as a gp a lot of headaches are tension headaches and that's all related to muscular tension in the back of the neck and where do muscle- um, where did where do tension headaches manifest uh, well they usually the classic description is that they're a band sometimes around the front of the head sometimes around the back of the head okay and they, they tend to be very they tend to be much more constant not easily relieved by medication uh, as a general rule I'm looking at two points that I've got in my notes from messages I received earlier on headaches across brow and lower slash back of skull okay so that you know that is almost <laughs> yeah so that there you go and no, we didn't rehearse that at all no yeah, we didn't. Kind of, no, that is, that's exactly a classic description of a tension headache. Okay. And you have to remember that there are mus- most of you, you kind of, you only got to have a briefest glance at the anatomy of the head and neck to see that there are muscles that, you know, they interlock all the way up around your forehead, the side of your head, all those muscles interlock. And if you have your, the, the muscles in your neck are under tension, there's often a knock on effect that those muscles across the front of your head and your forehead are under tension and you end up getting headaches. Okay. So actually getting your screen position right can often deal with chronic headaches and, and kind of tension headaches, which is incredibly useful. So I suppose if you've gone Bluetooth keyboard and mm-hmm. let's say that you are working at a notebook, that allows, yeah. that allows you then to, you could get anything. You could get a stack of books. You could get some, yeah. you could get a, a proper stand, I suppose, that you could yeah. put, your, put your laptop on. But freeing yourself up with keyboard and mouse from being attached to the notebook also enables you to get the screen up in the air as well. So you kill two birds yeah. with one stone. Yeah, exactly. They're the two big things. If you get an external keyboard and raise up your laptop, and you're right, you can buy notebook risers and all that and spend money on it. I don't have one of those. I use, I, I use I, when I'm in my office, I just use three or four weighty medical textbooks. Yeah. Go underneath my laptop and that just does the job very nicely. I have an old keyboard from an, an ancient iMac that I have plugged in with a USB connection yep. and a, a dead cheap mouse. And there, there you go. I use my MacBook with those and that's, I, you know, and it's much more comfortable. Yeah. Um, I think, well, I mean, for anyone who's listening, I know that you can get, if you, if you are um, a workflow nerd as some of us are and you yeah. like, you like your gestures and stuff, your multi-touch yeah. tools, Apple do a partner trackpad, which is yeah. exactly the same as you would get on your laptop on a MacBook yeah. Pro or something similar, and it gives you the opportunity to do all the same. You can get a, you can actually get an expanded version of the Apple keyboard as well, which has got the uh, one to nine numpad on the right hand side of yeah. it as well. So you can yeah. actually end up with a, a better functionality keyboard by taking it off and down. But you know, to hear that you use um, something that's yeah. may- may- maybe not from quite from this century, and you're still <laughs> you're still you're still saying that it's it's a, a viable alternative. A yeah. preferable alternative that's uh that's yeah, re- think, reassuring someone's got some line around somewhere yeah i think to be fair i think it was about 2003 that imac so yeah it wasn't it wasn't quite last century but it's it's pretty damn close Not far the, um, the only, I, there is that's a good point because i do actually find that, that I, what i struggle with slightly when i use that is that i'm a lot i'm used to using the gestures on the touchpad yeah so i do find that a bit awkward but what i've tried very hard to do and i've been doing this for the last few months is um, I'm trying to learn the keyboard shortcuts. So I don't use the mouse at all because I actually think that's a much better way to go anyway. So, so you don't go to the mouse and have to start. And it just, you know, in terms of workflow, it's more efficient just to use the keyboard shortcuts anyway. So I'm 100%. working hard to learn them. So it, there's uh, one of the co-hosts when we do our normal shows, Yusuf, who'll be listening, will be creaming in his pants right now as he hears you talk <laughs> about, as he hears you talk about keyboard shortcuts. Have you used Alfred before? Uh, well, no, I know of Alfred, but I, I never have used Alfred, actually. Okay. No, you're going to sell it to me. Oh, I mean, it is just an absolute game changer. Lifehacks 104 uh, yeah. fully fully explains how far down the Alfred rabbit hole myself and Yusuf have tumbled. But um, <laughs> yeah, you are right. One of the one of the main, Juju Mufu, who is a, a bodybuilder and tricker, but also big into periodization for work and training. Yeah. He, he talks an awful lot about never using the mouse. 
He's yeah. got everything is set up to swipe, to move between apps. Um, yeah. And you, you're totally correct that the less that you can use the mouse, if you're looking at really dialing in to be as efficient as possible with your workflow, getting off the mouse is, is great. And a lot of people do get a bit of kind of, you talk about discomfort, and I'm sure a couple of people have probably mentioned repetitive strain injury. I think you mentioned it at they the start have, there. Yeah. Use, using the mouse is often a source of enormous discomfort for some people who get RSI. Why is and, that? Um, I, I guess it must just, um, I don't know why exactly. I guess it's any repetitive movement, particularly when you hold something, you, you hold your arm. I mean, you can get RSI anywhere in the body technically, yeah. but I guess most people get it in their, um, they get it in their hands, wrists, forearms. So fine, fine motor movement with little bits of control and sort of small stabilizations and stuff like that. I guess if you're doing that seven or eight hours a day. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. And that's the kind of, so a lot of people then suddenly, you know, get, it becomes really uncomfortable and distressing to keep on doing that. And that's exactly the kind of thing that can trigger off a bit of RSI in some people. You you seem to have a, a pretty good understanding of RSI. And am, am I right in thinking RSI actually has two two distinct types to it? Yeah. Can, um, you, can you elaborate on that for me? Yeah, sure. I could I run that. Basically, I'm not sure I have a good understanding of it. In that I'm not sure anybody has a good understanding of it. It's the only thing I would say. First <laughs> but if anyone, all. if anyone does... <laughs> we're relying on you here yeah so um the first thing i say is there's two types the rsi type one is easy and they're, they're the ones where people do have a good understanding of it and it's usually got a very distinct diagnosis and the classic example is carpal tunnel syndrome um, and lots of people have heard of that it's where the kind of the the the, the nerve that goes through your wrist the median nerve uh, there's a little sort of tunnel or space at the wrist there and for various reasons it can happen things like pregnancy it can happen for all sorts of reasons uh that gets a little bit um, pressurized, that nerve, and you get symptoms that then go into your hand. And so there's a very, with things like carpal tunnel syndrome or certain tenosynovitis, where it's where you get an inflammation in the tendons going to your thumb or other things, there's a very, there's usually a very clear treatment. Um, and, uh, you know, there may be injections, there may be carpal tunnel syndrome, you can even go on to have operations and releases. Um, they're the kind of the ones that are relatively easy to manage. And as a GP, we don't feel too stressed by them because and the patient doesn't feel too feels better because we can give them a diagnosis yes. and, and offer a management plan. That's in comparison to RSI type two, which is a whole world of pain in, oh, no. you know, in, in several respects because it's really nebulous and it's difficult to, there's not a single cause. It just usually is when people get numbness and discomfort and aches maybe pins and needles and it isn't really obviously reproducible it kind of maybe varies a little um but it doesn't fit into any of the nice distinct patterns of these other kind of disorders like carpal tunnel syndrome but can it be um due to a, a, a repetitive action which could be causing rsi1 does that make sense so it's yeah it, yeah, it, yeah you you yeah. could be you could be suffering with both essentially yeah, I think in many cases it probably is due to some kind of repetitive, you know, or various ongoing stress or tension yeah. that is the case. So you definitely could, um, you, yeah, you, de you could definitely have them coexisting in some shape or form. Okay. The problem, because it's not a sort of a definite way of managing it, it makes it harder to offer a definitive solution like a steroid injection or a surgical operation that you can do in carpal tunnel. I understand. So it's a bit frustrating for patients. Um, and it's certainly a bit frustrating um, and for doctors as well, because, you know, you, we, we're in the business of trying to help people. You can't, <laughs> actually, you can't work out what's what's wrong or how to fix it. No, and, it's, and the, the difficulty <coughs> is, and so this is where I, I think there's been some tension between patients and doctors in this, is that you usually have to stop what you're doing. I mean, and Everything. That's, really, that you, <laughs> that's the thing. It depends how the doctor phrases it, of course, yeah. because that generally goes down incredibly badly. Yeah. If you're, if you're generally you're either working or if it was writers, no, no writer wants to stop writing yeah. or it, it might be something like work related and people can't stop doing it. But I think that my general advice is it's not really so much about stopping what you're doing, but you really have got to change up the way you do things cool. in order to, to get it to resolve itself. I understand. And, if you're working at a keyboard, you, you know, you're, you're um, flying a desk in the day, yep. you've probably got to alter how you do. Um, you certainly got to alter your workplace, but I think some of the answers are a little bit more holistic and a bit more widespread as well. Yeah. Um, um, and certainly Joanna in the book, The Healthy Writer, goes through this, that actually I think she tried a whole lot of, well, she got RSI very badly, and she's a really good kind of case report in this regard. 
that actually she tried all the different mouses, the keyboards, all of that, and it didn't make any difference. And what in the end fixed her was a whole body approach. And she actually, yoga, right? Oh. Yeah, yoga, and it totally fixed her. <laughs> and I think that's the thing. If you get your core strength improved, you start to get you improve your posture generally. You you know it might address tension issues as well from stress and anxiety. Actually, then that might be the solution. I think I, it, it feels like you're reading my notes off my screen at the moment, but I swear to the <laughs> listeners that you're not. I'd split up um, optimizing your workstation into two categories, one of which was solutions when you're there and another was solutions when you're not. Yeah. And I think, as you say there, it, it needs to be married with the two. If Even if you optimize your workstation, but when you go home, that you're, you're sedentary at home, and you're not, yeah. like you say, you're not building up any core stabilization. You're not getting your heart rate up. You're not getting any fresh air. The, yeah. all, all of these sort of things are, are going to lead to um, a problem on either side. And they both need to be looked after, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And, I, and I, I suspect it's far, far more important than actually the workplace stuff, all that stuff. And you get so many other benefits as well. But you can sort of imagine why a consultation with a doctor might go badly because you turn up complaining of pain in your wrists and your doctor tells you to get out and do a bit more walking or exercise yeah, or take up that, yoga. How that help? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you, they really could. But actually, I really do think it is. So you've got to have those conversations very carefully, absolutely. not to upset, to make people understand. But I, I think actually it's a massive part of it. And, and going right back to what you said at the start, I suspect this is the kind of thing that, you know, 10 years, 20 years in the future, the workplaces will do automatically, that actually there'll be regular breaks, there'll be opportunities to stretch, to walk, get away from the screen. And rather than sitting in a call center eight hours straight, whatever it is, actually there will be requirements to yeah. kind of to build in proper breaks. So we've we've touched on it there. I'm gonna I'm gonna um unload the the meta-analysis that my very um <laughs> very well conducted Instagram research uh, came yeah, yeah. out and then we're going to try and design how someone could have a good working practice when they're sat at a desk. So yeah. um, tight hips, back pain, both upper and lower neck pain, the headache across uh, their brow and the lower back of the skull uh, difficulty in opening up the chest from being in that anterior folded forward sh shoulder tilt yeah. and a pain or weakness in between the shoulder blades, which presumably is from the same, from not sitting with that open chest yeah. position. Um, if you were to try and design someone's working day, so we've got their keyboard down off the computer, potentially an external mouse as well. We've managed to lift the cranial angle up by uh, raising the height of the display. Mm. what are we going to do next with regards to a seating posture? What about working rhythms, work rest and stuff like that during work? What can be done to assist in mitigating these problems? I mean, I think there's some basic stuff around seating posture you can do, which is just, I mean, we're obviously talking seating at the moment rather than standing or anything else more yeah. exotic because that's simply not an option for most people. Yeah, um, it's, it's just simple stuff that actually, I mean, I guess... Uh, you know, getting your feet on the ground is a massive thing when you're sitting down and getting your getting yourself in a nice neutral position rather than your legs being stretched out and then that kind of changes the position of your lower back and um flattens out that kind of normal curve that you have in your spine is actually sitting on your sit, actual sit bones getting your feet flat on the ground okay and then trying to and obviously some of that then is about being aware of your posture um, as you mentioned there about the kind of the, not opening up the chest, is dropping your shoulders, making sure that they're nice and relaxed. I think just spending a few minutes every, we could talk about the rhythm of this, but yes. actually trying to build awareness, whether it's every 20, 25 minutes running through a little self check mm -hmm. about what is my posture like at the moment and trying to, um, uh, and trying to adjust it as you go is the kind of thing that if you do regularly can start to become automatic and you actually um, improve uh, improve your general posture. Yes. Um, I mean, I think in terms of rhythm, that, that sort of breaks is critical I, I, more than anything. How, taking a break is absolutely essential. And my, my, my personal approach to this is when I'm in a big block of writing or sitting at the computer is I, I tend to use the sort of Pomodoro method anyway because I find that quite effective, but it works really well with taking breaks. So 25 minutes um, of work, set a timer on the watch, it buzzes, uh, and then I get up and I take five minutes off. And during that five minutes, I'll almost I will make sure I get up and I walk around, uh, have a bit of a you know, and just 
uh, get myself away from the screen as well. Yeah. To, to help with my eyes, which we can also mention. Yes. Um, uh, to to help with that, and I find that that really makes a huge difference. I, the key for me about the taking breaks is, and the thing I would mention to people, and this fits, is that you've got to get away from the screen if you can. Yeah. Uh, the, you know, taking a break does not mean pushing the chair back. <laughs> you know, sl- <laughs> moving further away from the screen or closer to the screen, or looking yeah. at your looking at your phone, looking at a different screen. Instead. Yeah, looking at your phone and checking, you know, checking Instagram yeah. and Facebook That's not while staring at another screen while you kind of slump in your. In, in your Slump in your chair. That's I'll, really I'll take that's a break. not an effective I'll, break. I'll, I'll take a break from my newly refined posture to slouch in my seat, put my, my head at a 90 degree angle to the floor and sneak a quick look at my phone instead. Yeah, exactly. That's, so, not, that's not what we're prescribing here. Yeah, and I think, you know, most people listening would think, well, of course I wouldn't do that. But I mean, I've yeah, done it myself. I think you might do. Yeah, <laughs> I, think, I think you probably will. So actually taking... Taking, taking a break is something most people know, but actually it's putting it into action as well, isn't it? Like all these things and actually doing it properly. So you give yourself a, gen, a, um, a um, an actual genuine chance of improving. I, I find if I do it, I can sustain much longer working periods at 25 minutes, five minutes. I can do three or four hours of solid work in the morning and actually don't feel completely ruined by it. I agree. I think there's... um. It's a a short term sacrifice of work, obviously, by taking the five minute break. But the total volume that you get, the total time, effective time under the curve of work done by the end of the day will always be higher. Um, yeah. It's interesting that you mentioned the Pomodoro technique, which I am currently reading the illustrated guide to the Pomodoro technique in a desperate attempt to try and make my work, <laughs> my work life a little bit more optimal. But Be Focused Pro, for anyone who's listening, is a, uh, an app for Mac, which is very, very light. And it does exactly that. It allows you to work on one task at a time. You set a timer for 25 minutes. And then once it's up, it goes to a five minute uh, break and tells you, right, now go away for five minutes and then come back. And I yeah. think I think that so during those five minutes, what are people doing? Walk to the water cooler, check the toilet, sort of, you know, yeah. look look out the window. Yeah, there's a, there's yeah, I mean, there's a there's a certain thing in terms of eye strain about looking out the window. There's a a kind of a bit of advice which is the twenty 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 technique for eye strain, which is every twenty minutes, um, take a break and look out the window, sort of focus on something twenty feet away for twenty seconds. I think if you're taking a natural break every five minutes and just you know changing the focal length where your eye is, eyes are concentrated. That's really helpful. And that can be helpful in relieving eye strain. Yeah. Um, so you can get some benefit from that as well. But I think that just the moving around is the key thing. If you, you know, I, yeah, absolutely. I do that. I, I get up, I just have a stretch, say I'm working in the library or the office, go out, have a look at the window, walk up and down the steps, for, you know, a few minutes, but try not to get engaged in any conversations. At yeah. The water that five minutes, get that five minutes going to turn into 25 minutes. Yeah, exactly. And the key is just kind of a few minutes, try to think about something else completely mm. and then actually back to it. And it's, an, as you say, the, the time under the curve, you end up far more productive. Um, and I find it really helps to focus as well because that 25 minutes is a relatively short period. And so and I, I will give my all to that one task for 25 minutes. And, you know, you then achieve much greater, deeper work. The Cal Newport kind yeah. of thing, which I know you've mentioned before, I think. Yeah. yeah and the Cal Newport book is one that I kind of, I recommend to almost every, you know, the people, my colleagues, particularly younger academics, again, Cal Newport, this is the way to go. This is what you have to do. And yeah. you can be enormously productive with minor, relatively minor changes. It's intense work, intense break, right? It's all or nothing, yeah, yeah. on or off. Um, yeah. And I think an, an awful lot of the time, especially because a lot of people may be, especially knowledge workers, how many tabs have you got open at once? You're switching between 20, oh, yeah. 25 different tasks at once. Oh, well, I'm also content sourcing for Instagram. So social media is up and I've, anyone, uh, anyone who's listening knows just how much I hate the rabbit hole of cognitive manipulation that, uh, that occurs as soon as you get onto a, onto a social media website. But yeah, it's, um, yeah. It's, yeah, m- m- multitasking is for Muppets. That's my kind of <laughs> my, my approach. It really is. One there's thing at no, one time. Yeah, there's not a shred of evidence that you can multitask as effectively as you can, you know, the kind of the intense burst of productive work you get from focusing on one thing. That's what we're designed to do. We're, we are um, serial we should be serial focuses rather than doing rather than trying to multi, do multiple things and it's incredibly satisfying 
Yeah, I, there's that, taking it taking it off the to do list and getting it out of the way is such a lovely sense of achievement. Yeah, and I think even just that kind of, even if it's a bigger part of a bigger um, a bigger piece of work, just knowing that you've really buried yourself 25, 30 minutes, yeah. done a really intense burst. Um, it is, it is incredibly satisfying. The whole of the healthy writer I actually did with the Pomodoro method and I ticked off, I had little circles and every, every circle represented two Pomodoros. And it was the one thing that looking back and when I could see a hundred of them ticked off. I was going to say, how many, how many did it take? I think it was about, for my bit, it was over a hundred hours of editing. Oh wow. But after the first draft, once that, once that had been done. (laughs) But it was kind of, it was incredibly satisfying to see, to color in the boxes and, but to know that each of those was a really valuable a really piece of the puzzle. It so was what, great. What you're saying is that we are, for all that Chris Ryan from Sex at Dawn may disagree, we are monogamous when it comes to most optimal <laughs> workflow approach. We should be, yeah. we should be monogamous, not polyamorous. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. A, a task is for one at a time. Not for two, not for two or more at a time. Yeah, <laughs> fine, fine, absolutely fine. Yep. So, um, you you touched on it there, and one of the um next main issues which people came up with was an inability to switch off at night, mm. eyes flickering as if you're still staring at the screen. Also, eye strain. I know that my business partner Darren, who will be listening, has just had to start wearing glasses. Although he actually manages to pull them off as much as I wish that he didn't. Um, <laughs> he's had to start wearing glasses. And I think to myself, would he have needed to had we spent the volume of time that we do in front of a screen? So what what is looking at a screen doing to our eyesight? I think the main thing is, I, I don't know if there's any evidence that it increases your risk of um, refractory problems where you need glasses. But so it may just be he has a little bit of a, something like an astigmatism, which is just Darren, giving him just, extra you're problems. You're just blind, mate. Darren, you, you were never, you were never <laughs> ever destined to be able to see properly, I'm afraid. <laughs> no, just born, born damaged. Cursed with that, yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think the main thing about staring at a screen is it dries your eyeballs out. They end up like shriveled up. The, we normally blink about once every five seconds or something, uh, 12 to 15 times a minute, something like that off the top of my head, I think is the right amount. But when you start staring at a screen, you stop blinking. And um, to the extent that you only blink about sort of five or six times a minute, so wow. once every 10 so seconds. You're, you're talking about like a, a 60% reduction. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. And I, I kind of the whole thing about tears is obviously they're required to keep your eyes moist and stop them drying out. And they help clear um, bugs. And it's, a not, so it's an important protective mechanism for your eyes as well. So it's, is it moisturizing the cornea on the front of the eye then to a degree? Yeah, certainly. There's always that film of tears across the front of your eye, across in front of your cornea. And if you, you, you as anybody, your cornea, if for some reason you can't blink, you say you get like a, a facial nerve palsy, a Bell's palsy, where you can you can no longer close your eyelids properly. Okay. One, one of the priorities for us when we see something like that is to, people have to tape their eyes shut at night. And they have to use artificial tears. Otherwise, the front of their eye dries out and the cornea can become quite damaged, ulcerated. Oh, now, wow. I'm not saying staring at a screen will do that to you, but you're at that kind of point where... Well, the, bottom end, is, the bottom end will be getting towards yeah, it, right? Yeah, blinking's important. You know, that's, you know, and if you stop blinking as much, <laughs> then you're not going to... Your, your eyes are going to feel uncomfortable and they're going to be gritty and irritable and maybe slightly itchy and just feel just you know like you've got sand we've all had that feeling you know your eyes have been sprinkled with sand yeah and they just feel dreadful um and so there's a couple of things you can do that perhaps can reduce eye strain one of them is to sit a little bit further back from your screen so usual advice is more than i certainly read a there was a good study which showed more than 50 people who were sat more than half a meter away 50 centimeters from their screen had less eye strain and that's probably about an arm length or so so and the ridiculous thing about that is, and laptops are bad for this, that we, as well, it's another way that laptops damage us, <laughs> is that we crane over them and our nose are pract- is practically touching the screen. Yeah. But well, the whole point is because the, the screen is, I'm just looking at mine now, it's two inches yeah. away from the top of the yeah. uh, the top of the keyboard. So again, if you're not on Bluetooth, yeah. key, Bluetooth keyboard, Bluetooth mouth, your mouse, you're uh, tethered, you're tethered, your face is tethered to the front <laughs> of the screen. Very few people type with their arms straight out in front of them. The, uh, and I wouldn't recommend that either. So your laptops are designed to be bad for your eye in terms of your eye yeah. in, in that regard. Um, so 
so that's really important. I kind of I've lost my thread now in terms of the eyes. Um, um, moisturizing the eyes. You were talking yeah. about a, a, oh, yeah, a number of a number of solutions. Yeah, fifty centimeters. Yeah, yeah. So you had to be more than fifty centimeters away. So that's really so. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Is that um, use the zoom function. You know, who, who, how many people are, are sitting there with their Word document on 100% or whatever writing software you're using? Just crank it up to 200%, 250% and sit back a bit. Yeah. Um, there's no requirement to be close enough to see the screen. All computers have accessibility features yeah. it, within them. So from that regard, there's, you just got to learn to delve into the settings a little. Okay. Push the, push the screen away from you and um, increase that font size. I'm going to guess a potential solution for someone who is maybe looking to go maximally optimal of this would be to go for an external display as well. A larger external display that could potentially be mounted up on a wall or could be just raised up with a stand. And then you'd have the the keyboard at where you need it. You could have the the larger display, which allows you, if some people feel like they need to be able to multitask, but also want to have the large size font, you can't, you can't have your cake and eat it with this, can you? You can't have lots mm-hmm. of things on a small screen, plus all of them be really big. Or yeah. else you're going to be you're going to be whizzing whizzing around the screen like a like a, a blue bottle. Um, yeah, and I think about multi-screen options are easy, and certainly I do that in my office. I've got a PC that sits in my office, and I use uh, whatever it is cable that connects it up, yep. DVI adapter, and I have my laptop screen on one side <coughs> and the um, external monitor on the left from the PC on the other side. So I've got a couple of monitors, um, and you know I can flick between. They're just different workspaces on the MacBook. And so I've got a two-screen option, dead easy, just using my laptop that I normally use and can take home with me. Yeah, um, Dead easy, works really well. Yeah, that sounds great. So can you just tell us the 20-20-20 rule again and why, what that's doing in terms of the, the focal length for your eyes and stuff like that? Well, yeah, I think the, the whole thing about the 20-20 rule is so every 20 minutes or so, take a break from your screen and stare at something 20 feet away for 20 seconds. And I think it probably just helps reduce eye strain rather than your eyes being fixed in a sync, your, your, all the muscles around the eye, the ocular muscles being fixed in one position. It just forces you to contract and move them a little bit as well. So they have to do the work of pulling open your, um, of changing the focal length so you focus at a different distance. So it gets them moving. But it probably also just when you look somewhere else and you move around, it forces you to blink. <laughs> and it makes you blink. Now you can. Co- I've read some places where it says make sure you blink every thirty seconds or whatever, or you know, blink every ten seconds, and it will become natural. I I find that hard to believe that it wouldn't be a constant distraction trying to remember to blink. Yes. So, yeah. So the tr- the trick is just to change your change where you're looking a little, so you look at something a little bit different, and then that will you'll naturally blink when you do that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, you'll achieve the goal of actually blinking a bit more often, moisturizing your eyes, giving your, fo- giving your muscles a little bit of a change of, persp- a change of focal length, which will just work those ocular muscles a little. And that's likely to reduce the, your eye strain generally. So I suppose that ties in again, as we've said, with the Pomodoro technique of going for the 25 minutes. You can do yeah. that as part of your little loop that you do to get up, to go to the bathroom, yeah. to do whatever it might be. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't, you don't have to even think about the twenty 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 thing if you're doing the Pomodoro because you're going to do it naturally anyway. So it, it becomes, it, it ceases to be a problem. But if you, for some reason, you can't get up or you're stuck at a desk, you yeah. can't move, even just twenty minutes, just doing that thing for sort of twenty seconds yeah. will actually help reduce your eye strain. And the other thing to reduce your eye strain is get a little, get a little, um, get some artificial tears, get some eye drops. You know, okay. if you got really, if you get really bad eye strain, eye drops are an absolutely, you know, they work. They will, they will, they will do the, um, that's what we give to people who can't blink properly or like, you know, got facial paralysis yeah. and can't close their eyelids. They, they will, they will do the job. Okay. So is there a reason why you would get this, uh, the manifestation of eyes flickering at night as if yeah. they're still staring at a screen? Do you understand what that's due to? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but I suspect it's somebody, you know, it's somebody who's just got too much screen time and is not making it and it's not reducing I mean, my, my, my sense is, I don't think, I'm not aware of any sort of specific neurological problem that that is due to, yep. but it sounds like somebody who desperately needs to unwind a little and have an hour, <laughs> someone, some, someone who needs to have an hour before they go to bed of not looking at a screen. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, we haven't talked about sleep and we've, we've got a chapter in sleep in the healthy writer. And, uh, I mean, for me, it's a superpower and I prioritize it now more in my life more than I have ever done in my whole life. Because if I don't sleep right, my life is rotten. And if I get my sleep right, I feel great. And part of that good sleep hygiene is 
turn, not looking at my screen. I go to bed at 10. My screens go off at nine. Digital sun, sunset, right? Absolutely. And you can do that whole using flux or those, the things that change the kind of the, um, the, the background. Yeah, the hue of your screen. And I do a little bit of that as well. But actually, you can't beat just the off switch mm-hmm. <laughs> is the way to do it. And no. I think if you really value your sleep, then you've just got to get off your devices and you know, read a book. Yeah. No, I, there was uh, some really interesting studies. Have you read Why We Sleep by Matthew, Matthew Walker? I have, yes. Yeah, well, Very I mean, good. Anyone, anyone who's listening who's having trouble sleeping, before you try and get hold of melatonin or think that burning incense or getting a diffuser in your room is where you need to go, buy Matthew Walker's book, Why We Sleep. Or if you can't deal with the reading of that, if you want to listen to Joe Rogan podcast 1109, I know it off by heart because of how many times I've listened to him on it. <laughs> it's one of my favorites and he is, he's absolutely fantastic. And the, the, um, the summaries that he makes and the, um, conclusions that he draws about just how important sleep is to short-term and long-term health, longevity and all the rest of it is they're terrifying. They're nothing short of terrifying. I, I, I think I, I, you know, if moving is really incredibly important, getting more exercise, but the three pillars of going, being healthy are moving more, eating a bit better, however that is, but sleep is number is absolutely up there as that kind of holy triumvirate yeah. of being healthy. And if you're not getting your sleep right, everything else falls apart. And I've got three kids. They were like, they're now a little bit, they're now like 11, 12 and 13. But when they were one, two and three, I wasn't getting a whole lot of sleep. Mm. And I just, you know, my kind of the difficulties of motivating yourself to do exercise, to cope with your normal work, the kind of the, um, extra kind of anxiety it provokes and the difficulty kind of level and everything's men- been turned men- up right then men are oh it just cranked and you know obviously as a doctor i've had some experience of sleep deprivation and in the <laughs> army they were the army were quite keen on it as well at times yeah so i've been through the pain of not sleeping and life is just so shabby yeah <laughs> that actually that's why i prioritize it um and there's so many things you can do which don't require taking medication the evidence of melatonin is really weak there's a little bit of evidence in older people over the age of 55 that it can help you get to sleep a bit quicker and your quality of sleep's a wee bit better, but there's not good evidence it makes any difference in younger folk. There's potential uh, for resetting circadian rhythms when traveling as well, right? I think it's a good way to hack jet lag, or at least Matthew Walker alludes to that in the book. It's, um, yeah, they've certainly looked at it hard. I, I, I'm not sure how good the evidence is for that either. There may be a wee bit. Yeah, I know that's certainly been tried by a lot of people. So um, rely and, on rely on what we know works, which is digital sunset, reduce yeah. reduce the or increase the melatonin response naturally. Yeah, by not having um, yeah, there's, blue there's, light there's, pouring into your eyes and at 20 seconds <laughs> before you go to bed. Yeah, well, I think that's it. I think my eyes would be jumping around a bit um, if that were the case. <laughs> if I if I did that, and I don't, my my phone goes on the airplane mode at nine and. Happy days. Well, I think one of the, anyone who's listening will know what I'm about to say. One of my number one solutions for anybody is to charge the phone over the other side of the room. And when, yeah. when you get into your bedroom, uh, as I explained in a Hacker in Your Pocket podcast and in number 10 with Kai Wei from the Light Phone, your, um, when you are in a inertial frame of reference, the likelihood of you staying there when you're on your phone is greater. So use your phone when you're standing in your bedroom, fine. But as soon as you lie down, you're not allowed to have your phone in your hand because if you're laid down okay. with your phone in your hand, you're probably gonna you're probably gonna stay there, and it's more likely you're gonna stay there than if you were sitting. More likely that if you were sitting than if you were standing. So charge the phone over the other side of the room. Get an alarm clock that doesn't require you to put an alarm on your phone, yeah. or do both, and then your alarm will go off over the other side of the room, and you've got to get up. It, it blows yeah. my mind. It blows my mind that there's an entire industry of these rug. Alarm clocks. I don't know whether you've seen them where you have to <laughs> no. you have to stand on a little mat to turn an alarm clock off. I'm like, well, you could just put an alarm <laughs> anywhere else that wasn't next to the bed and it achieves the same objective. But that's you know, I'm not gonna get sent one of those for free anymore. Definitely off No, I think you've blown it there, yeah, totally. it, you're, right. you're right off their list. Ruined it. Yeah, um, I my, I mean the thing is if you're a student and your your room is your bedroom sort of thing, then absolutely you've got to deploy some new strategies. But if you've got a separate bedroom, then don't let the phone in your room. Yeah. You know, Bedroom is a phone-free zone. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's the, that's the absolute goal, right? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. So, moving on, hot desking mm. and university libraries. So you actually you actually touched on this earlier on. If someone doesn't have the capacity to, um, let's say, perfectly customize or build build their ideal workstation, I know that 
I was right in saying that almost all doctors will be using shared desks at work. Um, well, uh, yeah, Un- um, yeah, certainly a lot will be. Yeah, uh, certainly GPs. There's a, a lot of GPs work part time, and you, yeah, you're going to be sh- a lot of premises struggle. So you won't, you are to a certain extent, you're you won't have your own room. You'll be going in and out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what are the um, carrying your bag or the I guess the SOS um, <laughs> pack <laughs> of trying to fix ergonomics for work there? Um, yeah, so I think, I mean, an external keyboard and a mouse relatively light should be able to, I think if you've got a notebook, I, I guess it depends whether you're using your own laptop mm-hmm. and notebook or whether you're using, a, you know, like say a university student, uni, using one of the PCs in the library yeah. or whatever's available. I guess the first thing I'd say is you don't have to carry anything with you just to take a moment to, you can adjust the height screen of all of those. You can move things into the correct position. You can adjust the height of the chair mm-hmm. is actually rather than just plonking yourself down in, you know, whichever you know, weirdly proportioned person was there before you. <laughs> She's almost but, definitely not going to be exactly the same as yourself. Yeah, yeah quite. The, um, as actually take the time to make the adjustments. And as I said, get the, get the height of that screen. So it's just, you know, the top of the screen's level with your eyes. Get the, um, uh, get the seat at the right height so that you're kind of, your, your thighs are likely to be parallel to the ground and your feet are flat on the floor. Do those things first so that you're absolutely sorted out. I think then if you're doing your own, then in terms of working continuously, I would make sure I had some way of, not my phone, of um, preferably uh, of uh, a little alarm for 20, 25 minutes Mm -hmm. so that you kind of stick to it. I've got a little watch. My watch buzzes, so that's handy in the library when when I'm at the university library. It would Um, be cool if there was a a web-based Pomodoro timer, wouldn't there? Like a cloud-based one. I wonder if if someone's come up with that. That would be a really good... If someone needs a business idea, come up with Be Focus Pro for web browser that would allow notifications to pop up. That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you need to, you need to have that handy. I would, um, you know, if you can, a, a notebook riser is a little bit of a big ask, I think, cause they're probably quite bulky to fit in a bag. Yeah. But if you've got some books with you, you may be able to use them. The only thing I'd say is there are always books in the library. <laughs> yeah. That's a very good point. You're you not just got to go to the, near, you just got to go to the nearest shelf and pull off two or three books. Doesn't matter what they are. Stick yeah. them under your You're laptop. You're not taking them out. No one's going to, no one's going to. No, the librarians too. will put them away again. They're very nice like that. <laughs> In fact, they prefer it if, you, if they don't like it when you put them away. They prefer it to do it yeah, themselves. Yeah, they like, they, like the, they like the work, don't they? Yeah. I've always found they, that. They don't trust. They don't trust students, and they definitely don't trust staff to put them back where they got them. So Agreed. they're then lost forever. Agreed. Um, so you can grab a book. So you don't. You just use what's there. That's easy. Um, and then a little external keyboard and a mouse, and you're good to go. I think a little bottle of eye. Um, if you're going to, if you're, if you're really settling in for the long haul, yeah. Then. Um, uh, some eye drops is a good plan. Is there a, probably, is there an optimal frequency for using the eye drops every couple of hours or during every break? Is that is that are you going to end up swimming swimming in tears? If yeah, dripping. Break? Yeah, like crying. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, not especially. The general advice for these is we put them in every couple of hours if somebody's got absolutely nothing going. I think it depends how you feel. Yeah, uh, one or two hours. I don't think you need every twenty minutes would be a bit a bit much. You, yeah, and personally, I despise putting in eye drops. It's, it's, I, like, I'm, it's never going to be an easy task yeah. to accomplish, is it? Yeah, you're probably not old enough to remember the Friends episode where they tried to put eye drops in Monica for the whole episode. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's, it's, it turns into one of those for a lot of people. Okay. <laughs> so I, I would say a couple of hours is good. Got you. Okay, so I wanted to talk about some more, some of the slightly more funky solutions that I've seen <laughs> which exist for uh, people who want to really optimize their workstation. I know that Johnny, another one of the co-hosts of the show, um, he has a really fancy desk that g- does both seated and standing. Yeah, nice. I-, I know that the um, receptionist at uh, Be Fit, which is the uh, physiotherapy place that I go to around the corner, uh, sits on a Bosu ball. When I go in, she's on sat on a big, big Swiss ball, um, yeah. b- bouncing around. And I just, I wanted to know what the um, efficacy of those particular approaches are and if there's any others, any other sort of uh, weird and wonderful approaches you've seen for, I know, I know Ben Greenfield has a treadmill office, yeah. a, tre- a treadmill station where he can uh, walk on a true form runner at the same time as dictating yeah. and writing and stuff like that. Yeah, Ben's, he's quite out there though. He's pretty full on with his oh, self yeah. um, efficacy stuff. Oh yeah. Uh, 
Um, I would. The problem with all this is, and it's probably worth a, a, a very minor digression, is that the evidence is rubbish um, for a lot of this <laughs> stuff. It's really hard. And it's not rubbish as in, it's just hard to do good research, medical research into this kind of thing because, you know, you can't do it. There's no sort of placebo effect. So you can never quite know what you, whether you're measuring it in motivated people who then feel a bit better. or uh, So the evidence is really hard to pick out. Ten years, um, right? Yeah, it's just not good quality. And so it makes it really hard to offer definitive. You, you lurch into anecdote quite quickly mm. uh, and personal opinion. Um, I would say there's not an awful lot of evidence for Swiss bowls. So that kind of what's they, they fall under the category of dynamic sitting, that yeah. kind of where you've, you've got to continually adjust and micro adjustments with, you know, kind of using core strength and to keep yourself in an upright position. Um, I have a Swiss ball in my room. And I don't use it very often. Sometimes yeah. if I'm a bit bored, I'll sit on it. Yeah. Um, there, there isn't great evidence to make a huge amount of difference, but it's one of those which I think if you get relief, it does force you to sit in a probably much better, it improves your posture. You've, you've got to, you, you can't slouch on a Swiss ball or you end up on the floor. You know, you're, you're obliged to put your feet flat down. You've got to, you know, you've got to engage your core. You've got to sit up straight. So potentially so, rather than the the Swiss ball actually being something magical in and of itself. It's just forcing you into a position that you could replicate on a normal seat. I, I would, I would think that's almost entirely it though. I think there is a, there is a kind of evidence. There is research that's gone on around dynamic sitting to try to work out if it's all the micro adjustments that makes a difference. Well, I haven't read anything that really convinced me that there's great definitive um, evidence that makes a great, it makes enormous difference. Um, the other thing then is you're kind of in standing desks. Uh, as you mentioned, um, I've also got a standing desk at work. I haven't got a posh one. Um, I think uh, I think there were pictures posted at the time when the book came out last year that mine was just an old school desk, like a primary school desk. So I cut the legs off and then I whacked a bit of one inch MDF on the top um, and I didn't even nail it together. I just rested it on there. And um, that I find that really I find that really good. I, I kind of enjoy working there. But I like the variety. Sometimes I sit, sometimes I stand, sometimes I wobble around on my Swiss bowl. And sometimes I think that is the kind of the thing about these slightly wacky things is that it's just the variety that is really helpful um, and makes a difference to me. Um, there isn't an, there is some little bit of evidence for stand up desks in the literature that they can um, help in some respects, but for back pain particularly, but nothing, nothing really monstrously good. OK. Actually, there's a lot more evidence for Ben uh, Greenfield's treadmill desk, okay. which um, quite a few people use. And that certainly seems to be, uh, I've certainly read a couple of papers. One of them showed, you know, things like they measured people's cholesterol and, you know, kind of blood glucose to check for diabetes. And those, all those sort of markers were quite significantly improved when someone used a treadmill desk. Um, wow. But the weirdness of, I mean, and I suppose that makes sense because you're walking. Well, yeah. <laughs> so, so it's better than sitting there doing nothing. By a distance. Yeah. And they did also comment that they noticed that the you were, and as I always thought would be the problem with a treadmill desk, because it's just blooming hard to concentrate when you're walking yeah. on doing something else. And there, is a, there was a reduction in your sort of cognitive capacity when you're on a treadmill desk. Yeah. Well, but, you've, got, you've got to spend a little bit of, um, expend some mental force just, Walking, right? Not falling over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, you think you're doing it automatically, but it does require a little bit of effort. Yeah. But it's really good for sort of relatively low level tasks. And, uh, and, and, you know, Ben, when we chatted on this podcast about it, he said exactly that. It's done for answering emails, you know, doing other bits and bobs, admin tasks, not for the really deep work, the Cal Newport sort of really high focus. Cal, Cal would not be happy with a, a walking desk at all. No, if Cal was here, he would probably absolutely he would be slapping us yeah the, no tre the treadmill terms. would be out of the window um i'm just looking at so i got hold of the biohackers handbook which is uh, -huh. uh something ben greenfield's actually affiliated with Partway through that i've got the work um edition of this open there's one on work one on sleep one on nutrition one on exercise and it is showing me the effective body position on introvert vertebral disc pressure so a hundred percent disc pressure the effect of uh, the effect on four postures on the intravertebral disc pressure as measured between the third and fourth lumbar vertebrae. So a hundred percent when standing. If your back angle when sitting is at one hundred and ten degrees, so a little bit leaning back, it would be a hundred and five percent. At one hundred degrees, a hundred and fifteen percent. At ninety degrees, at one hundred and forty percent, and at eighty degrees 
at 190%. And that's sourced here. Hedman T and Fernie G, 1997, mechanical response of the lumbar spine to seated postural loads. Yeah. So not being in, uh, being leaned forward, which I see an awful lot, especially if you look in university libraries, you'll see that people a lot of the time will naturally hook their feet under themselves onto yeah. onto the little wheels and they'll pull themselves <laughs> right forward. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So their feet, yeah, are on, yeah. they're not even on the floor, they're on top of the seat, or on the, the base of the seat, yeah, yeah. and then they're leaned right forward. Apart from the little bit of assistance you'll get by having your elbows pushing up from the desk, you're going to be looking at nearly double the uh, disc pressure, which, yeah. is, which is pretty catastrophic, I imagine. Well, the only thing, uh, well, I've got a couple of thoughts. So the first thing I'd say is the simple fix for that is plant your feet on the floor, as we said earlier. Yeah. That kind of, that fi- that is the one hack that fixes that completely because you're right, it does put you into really awkward position. The only thing I'd say is it's a slightly proxy marker that. It doesn't actually tell you whether you'll get back pain or give you any problems. <laughs> yeah. Can you back it's, deal with it? Yeah, fine. Yeah, it's just measuring increase in pressure in one intervertible space. Actually, it doesn't necessarily mean it will turn into anything later on. Pressure because doesn't actually, equal uh, negative not necessarily, I, I, but I agree. It doesn't. I, I wouldn't wish to underestimate it. it it's clearly a pretty rubbish posture, yeah, yeah. <laughs> as well, and I likely to quite likely to cause your problems in the longer term. But I'm always a bit wary about the, the problem with the, the, the research is you can you, you see evidence like that, but it, it very it's very difficult to translate it into people who get back pain by you know later on down the line. So the real sort of clinical endpoints that we're interested in. Interesting. Yeah, that is cool. So I wanted to touch on more of the outside of the day, outside of work and outside of writing uh, yeah. health, the more sort of general health as we could call it. And I know that you are a fan of gratitude journaling based on some of the bits that I've read about you. I wanted mm-hmm. to allow you to elaborate. We haven't touched on gratitude journaling almost at all yet so far, although I do do it. I wanted to hear your thoughts on it and um, your experiences with it. Yeah. So, my and one of the things we wanted to do with the book was just to point out that writing in particular wasn't all just catastrophically bad for your health. There was a slight danger that the book was just going to be Give writing up being a work. writer. It's yeah, going to exactly. destroy Stop. you immediately. It's horrific. Yeah. Um, and one of the clearest bits of evidence about writing was writing is, I mean, there's certainly some medical stuff about writing as therapy um, and people with mental health problems and other things. But actually for just thinking for people in general and um, for the wider population, there's something everybody can do. Gratitude journaling has a really pretty decent has has some decent evidence that underpins it, and it goes back to um, some Californian psychologists um, who looked into this, uh, Emma and McCulloch, um, and they there was an experiment. It goes, I think, it was back to 2003 or the early 2000s, sometimes like sometime like that, and they they ran one of these studies that psychologists love to do, um, and they got the participants to write down just a few things that they were grateful for every day, whether that was the you know the kindness of a friend or a, a beautiful sunset and incredibly they only had to write a sentence and they only had to do it once a week so it was really not a big that's ask. low investment right yeah I mean, that is really you know the biggest problem with that would be remembering to do it because it's so low yeah uh, it's absolutely tiny and um they found that it really seemed to they, they stopped they found some clear improvements in well-being for those people and that they felt better but really intra- one of the things that really piqued my interest about that study is because i can be a little bit cynical about some of these psychologists psychology studies they're often got very low numbers and you know you've got to be careful about how far you draw your inferences with them yes but they also they also found evidence that the um the families of the participants had noted that their loved ones were seemed to be better in themselves and they had improved well-being and i thought that was that was a really um interesting kind of nugget as part of that that really kind of for me gave this a lot more credibility mm. and at the, the, the california psychologists have gone on to do more studies and there's some manchester um psychologists who've also looked into this and a host of others but what they also found so they also found that there was good evidence that doing a gratitude journal um could improve your sleep um, okay. and they, they, okay. it reduced your anxiety improved your sleep so it feeds exactly back into what we were saying before that, and if you have better sleep and you sleep longer, well, crikey, I mean, that is 
you can, you know, the, the effects that Matt Walker have talked about, has yeah. talked about in his book, that means that you're less likely to get cancer. You're less likely to have a heart attack. Alzheimer's. You're less, li- you're less likely to have a stroke or Alzheimer's. Yeah. So actually, there is incredible power. If a very simple intervention like a gratitude journal can reduce your anxiety, can help you to sleep a little bit better, there is, I mean, you've got to be a bit careful about pulling this chain out too far. Yeah, down, downstream, where do, you, where do you stop? Yeah, but there is... If it makes you feel better at the time, then that's a pretty good place to start. Yeah. And because, you know, people are not very good at doing stuff that will keep them, get, make them live six months longer when they get to <laughs> 70. They're, they're good at doing stuff that makes them feel good at the time. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of the experience of doing a gratitude journal that I've found and a lot of people have found is that it just helps you feel a little bit better about your life, helps you, it gives you a more positive slant on life. And it reduces that sort of stress and anxiety. There was a, um, an interesting, an interesting point that Yusuf made on one of the last podcasts, where the the typical experiment he says, "Look around your room for something red." Now close your eyes and tell me what in the room is blue, because the reticular activating system focuses <laughs> for it, it narrows in right. And his yeah. his argument was that something similar was going on. That it's very difficult to hold anxiety in the mind. At the same mm. time as searching, I, on my gratitude journal, I'll um, hold my hands up and say that some mornings, finding something which isn't what I wrote about the, the day before or just the first thing that comes to mind, i.e. I am grateful for the taste of coffee. I am grateful for, you know, it, it, can be, <laughs> it can be moderately challenging some days to come up with something which is meaningful. But that search for what is what does have meaning to me today? What am I genuinely grateful for today? it forces an awful lot of worries out. It's very difficult to hold both of those things in the same moment. Yeah, that, that may be exactly what's going on. I, I, I certainly haven't looked too hard into what the psychologists think. I, I mean, it's one of those things that people who get depressed and anxious often have intrusive negative thoughts and kind of ongoing difficulties breaking out of that cycle of negativity. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's the whole basis of something like CBT really is to help link how you think with how you behave with how you feel and break some of those barriers down and I wonder sometimes if gratitude journals just start to nudge that along a little bit they, they, they're an almost like an initial step perhaps with the, the, the bit you mentioned about actually holding um, negative thoughts in your head at the same time for those who haven't got as far as you know having full-blown depression or anxiety kind of problems mm. is that they're just a really simple little hack it's they nice it's you, nice do, you do them every morning? Uh, yeah, I do, yeah. Um, so I've got, I'll put a link in the show notes to uh, the Six Minute Diary, which is scandalously a ripoff of the Five Minute Journal, but <laughs> is is um, better as far as I'm concerned. It's by a company called Your Best Self. And um, it's available, it's available on Amazon. Okay. The, the, link, the link will be in the description, but it's three minutes on a morning and three minutes at night. Three, three things you're grateful for is the first thing you do in the morning. And mm-hmm. yeah, it's, it's interesting. Um, it helps to bring into perspective on more of a, a direct level from what you're actually writing when you do a gratitude journal. I find that it is brought more sharply into perspective things which I am actually grateful for. And surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting what those are because a lot of the time you look back at your day and you think, what did I do with my day, which produced something which I was grateful for the next day. And it's never, I'm grateful for gaining a thousand followers on Instagram. I am grateful for this. It's, <laughs> it's, it's stuff like, I'm grateful for the incredibly meaningful message that someone sent me about last week's podcast episode. I'm grateful, yeah. I'm grateful for the message that my mum sent yesterday or that I got to spend, I get to spend this afternoon off and I get to go and see my friends. Or do you know what I mean? It reminds you of what you should be spending your time doing because yeah. when, you, when you're alone with your thoughts, with nothing else to distract you, these are the things which percolate to the surface. Yeah, it's interesting because I think for such a little simple thing, it's got it's quite, it's probably, there's quite a complex set of consequences of doing it that it triggers off. And it got, you know, there's probably, it's working across multiple mechanisms. It would be very interesting thing. to work it out, eh? Yeah, I think it's, um, and it probably varies person to person. That's the thing as well. If you know, kind of in terms of you say breaking sometimes that negative cycle, just sometimes getting you to focus on the important things, just sometimes letting go of the petty, trivial irritations that you're letting <laughs> dominate your thoughts 
really incredibly useful it provides a lot of perspective so i wanted yeah. to i wanted to give you we haven't touched that much on writers per se but i know i have a uh access to a swath of uh us romance authors who uh hopefully will give a little a little cheer that uh, that they've got a shout out there and i know for a fact that a lot of them suffer with writer's block Right. And I wondered if you had any strategies for people who are potentially content creators, potentially writers, maybe on a blog, maybe authors, as I've said, and they're attacking either high volume or um, high frequency workloads of writing. Um, Are there any strategies which you employ to try and get around writer's block? Um. I'm not sure. I've not. I don't think I've ever suffered from writer's block as such, where I've just sat down and not been able to write anything. Mm. Um, and I know that a lot of it's perhaps a slightly contentious area, isn't it? That some people would claim it doesn't exist. There's certainly I've suffered from. You know, if if procrastination is a is a subset of writer's block, I would block, absolutely class it under that. Yeah. Yeah. Then I've suffered from that to the nth degree. And um, there's nothing like. I guess one of the best strategy I, I had was having a co-author. Because it's and I'm going to you know as a as a particular I guess it's a medic thing as a doctor we're it's very we're all kind of you have all this academic path and you pass exams and you're always wanting to please people that we're not very good at not doing what's expected of us mm-hmm. in some ways <laughs> so when I've got a commitment to somebody else and I guess that's one way of doing it and you could do that commitment whether it's you've got a co-author or whether you make that commitment publicly mm. that's a re- that's probably a really good way for me to beat procrastination I, the, the, a, a proper hard deadline external does, accountability it, absolutely it is what really does it for me when it comes to getting over pro- procrastination getting over that kind of subset of writer's block that's the one that i have the most experience with and you know i still suffer with on a daily basis there's always you know i could always tart up a website a little bit rather than actually writing some proper content for it mm. and it's just that kind of that um and that's just that's another it's not like i'm sitting around lying going to bed because i'm procrastinating out so i'm finding other petty jobs it's the low-hanging fruit rather than the deep work right yeah exactly and i guess it, yeah, it feeds right back into that is i need to go away and read cal newport's book again yeah to remind myself of how the hell to get down to some proper serious work <laughs> yeah i understand well you and i i really i really appreciate today i think we've um attacked a problem which is incredibly widespread anyone who is listening will have spent the at some portion of their last day sat in front of a laptop. And for those people who are spending a lot of time there, hopefully we've managed to provide some, some solutions. Can you tell the listeners where they can find you online? Yeah. So the best place to find me is, um, I have, my website is www.blokeology.io. So um, I've got, so I do some writing there on health, fitness, and a bit of lifestyle stuff. And I've got a podcast as well. So that's all at blokeology.io. And um, probably online, the best place to connect with me is you can get to me via Blokeology or just on Twitter. So uh, Ewan uh, underscore Lawson, that's E-U-A-N underscore L-A-W-S-O-N. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your time, Ewan. I'll make sure that the links to Blokeology, your Twitter, your podcast as well, which is fantastic. I'll make sure the links to all of that are in the show notes below. But thank you very much for your time. It's been a pleasure. No, uh, my pleasure entirely, Chris. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>